sparkling water. I'm sad, I'm sad, I'm sad. Once upon a time, there was a show called Avatar The Last Airbender. The subtitle was added because a certain James Cameron movie where a bunch of vaguely racist aliens have a group orgy with a tree was in production, and no one wants to get sued, least of all a children's TV company like Nickelodeon, that as we know now had some pretty big skeletons in their closet. Avatar The Last Airbender would prove to not only be a hit with kids, but a darling of fans of the fantasy genre everywhere. Everything from its character arcs, to its world building, to its animation was celebrated. Even if there were some problems here and there, it was a once in a lifetime achievement. A western animated show that could compete on a narrative level and have a fandom on par with, those are the big shonen anime that made it across the pond from Dragon Ball Z to Naruto. As a show popular with young boys, there was a certain character arc in Avatar The Last Airbender that in retrospect was deeply important. One where the character of Sokka goes from a bit sexist to leaning to fight from a troop of female warriors after they kick his ass with their martial arts skills, even donning their garb with the traditional makeup and everything. A girl, as the show points out, can be a warrior too. And you, boys, might even be able to learn a thing or two from them. I treated you like a girl and I should have treated you like a warrior. I am a warrior. But I'm a girl too. In 2024, Avatar The Last Airbender was remade in live action for Netflix, the company you might know for making a terrible live action version of Death Note, a terrible live action version of Cowboy Bebop, and a surprisingly good live action version of One Piece of all things, although there apparently wasn't enough money left in the budget after writing, directing and casting to buy some decent wigs for that show. Pirates. It's terrible. The Netflix version of Avatar The Last Airbender makes some interesting changes to the narrative of the show. In an interview prior to the release of the first season, the actor who plays Katara told Entertainment Weekly, I feel like we also took out the element of how sexist Sokka was. I feel like there were a lot of moments in the original show that were iffy. This of course, to anyone who knows the show well, was quite worrying. Sokka's sexism is shown explicitly to be a character flaw that he needs to overcome. It's presented as bad from the start, and him overcoming that throughout his character arc is a triumph. He even becomes romantically entangled with one of the female warriors he was making fun of upon completion of this character arc. Showing to the character, yes, but also to audiences, that sexism is not only wrong, but makes you look foolish, gets you beaten up, and leads you to underestimate people that you might treasure, or that might be able to give you the skills you need to achieve your goals. And only when you accept women are on an equal level to you, that you can learn things from them, that they are people worthy of respect, are you worthy of love? Sokka doesn't walk into a room of Kyoshi warriors reading a copy of The Game with his Chad-like jawline and follow the tactics of Fresh and Fit or Andrew Tate. Instead, he accepts that he needs to learn to fight from the Kyoshi warriors, dresses in their uniform, and asks them for help in the animated show. In the live action show, well... Thank you, Sokka. For what? For bringing the world to me. Hey, but that's worse. I mean, you, you, you do get how that's worse, right? Sokka walks onto an island full of female warriors, it's cool and hot, and Suki, the Kyoshi warrior who teaches them to fight in the show, spends all of her screen time hiding in the corner lusting after him, the man from the outside. Basically, she's the princess in the tower, he's the handsome himbo prince. He is hot and dumb, she's hot and can fight. They have no argument with each other, they just hang out and do some martial arts and then kiss, while the Kyoshi warrior's master makes some noises about not being distracted by a boy. The end result is actually pretty sexist, which is the opposite of the intention, if the pre-launch interview is to be believed. And even with that, Sokka is still a little misogynistic in episode 1, then the show is misogynistic in episode 2, showing its female warriors not dedicated to their craft and discipline, but secretly just waiting for a man to show up. Also, he doesn't wear the drag in the show, which as far as I know there haven't been any comments on from the actors. But given the current climate in the US right now, you can make a few guesses as to why Netflix didn't want their next big show to be stirring up controversy with its insurgent fascist movement. You should be proud. The silk thread symbolizes a brave blood that flows through our veins. The gold insignia represents the honor of the warrior's heart. Bravery and honor. Hey Saga, nice dress. Anyway, if you want to learn more about how the show screws this up, Jesse Gender, friend of the channel, just released a great video on that. What I want to talk about here, however, is the effect that this might have. How the world needs soccer now more than ever. The original soccer. The soccer who came into the story with sex assumptions 
and had them all torn down before him. This is a lesson we sorely need today, because there is a growing online movement that feeds on the sexism of teenage boys and encourages it to grow and fester until they are harassing women, making threats, or sometimes worse. For soccer, much like Ang before him, when the world needed him the most, he vanished. Don't fret though, viewers, because feminist storytelling devices might have left you, but I haven't. I, Bridget Empire, science and culture correspondent for Despicable Sexist Rag the Daily Telegraph, I'm here straight from my meeting with the executives over at Netflix, who assured me, as a representative of the British press, that they will continue removing any progressive messaging from their TV shows as to offend as few people as possible. When I asked them why they did this with cool and good character arcs like the ones in Avatar, and not with the continuous transphobic and anti-Semitic ramblings of Dave Chappelle, a man who's had more specials than the guy from Super Size Me just from Netflix alone, they told me to shut up and fuck off. So I shut up, and then I fucked off, and now I'm back here! So the skinny is, Dan here hired me to review Avatar The Last Airbender, but I don't think he knows what it is, so I'm just going to hand him this essay and hope he doesn't read it. I'm not interested in reviewing this show, besides telling you that it's garbage, and not even bad in a fun way like the M. Night Shyamalan adaptation, but frustrating in a load of really disappointing ways. Character arcs are stripped of any substance in favour of going from set piece to set piece with as little social commentary as possible, out of character moments are done all the time because they look cool on screen, and the show seems to not realise that to be invested in a show, you need to be invested in its characters, because not only does it take a while to show us any characters, it also takes away most distinguishing character traits from those we do have. So I would recommend, instead of watching the Netflix show, you rewatch the animated show. And honestly, I question why this remake exists at all, except that I know why. Hello, I like money. One of the best things about great fiction is the things it teaches you without you realizing it's doing so. Great writing can move you, can help you understand things and people without preaching. It can get inside your skin and give you revelations with the sheer power of story. So I was really glad that we had shows like Avatar to teach progressive messages warning of how detrimental sexism can be, not just to women, but to men too, using the point of view of character to take you on that journey. Sexism is Sokka's character flaw. It holds him back, it gets him in trouble, and makes him humiliate himself. By overcoming this flaw, he improves as a warrior and a companion to Team Avatar. He levels up in every way by overcoming sexism, because the misogyny he'd absorbed growing up was holding him back. It was handicapping his ability to learn and to deal with the world. And it also would have prevented him from dating that lady that turned into the moon, too. Because in the real world, women don't like men that treat them like shit. But you'd have a hard time believing that if you listen to certain voices that are like crack to teenage boys today. Which is why we need to be producing more narratives like Sockers, not cutting them to avoid dealing with these issues. For example, the one who sits here and tells me, well, depression's real. You're telling me that your mindset is weak and I'm not going to adopt the thinking of weaklings. Women have no shame in hiding the fact that they are sluts. Oh, the woman, the woman. There is an oil rig hiring. <laughs> there is an engineer. I would actually love hiring. to see Ava Santino on No, oil seriously, rig. seriously. Okay. Women are being indoctrinated to not need you and to not want you. Okay? They only go after the top guys. Top so since a lot of these girls have this mindset that they can do better, they deserve better, guess what happens? They think they can do better than you! <laughs> can you buy me my nails? Can you take me shopping? Can you get me some lashes? Can you do this for me? Can you drive me there? Okay, fine. Can I get a little bit ahead? No! What are you saying? Am I only worth my... You don't like my personality? Okay for women to paint men with a broad brush as something to be feared, but if men did the same thing to women, it would be considered sexist. One of the ways that societies around the world have figured out that you keep young male aggression under control is by enforcing monogamous standards, because it gives everyone a chance in some sense. Men take all the risk when it comes to marriage. Yep. Period. Okay? You're the one that's putting your money on the line. You're the one putting the ability to see your children on the fucking line. You're the one that's gonna have to go to divorce court and take the L most of the time and pay the alimony. So the reason why I'm saying you need to have a good idea of female nature and have had sex with multiple girls is because guess what? When you have sex with a girl, the game is over. You get to figure out who the fuck she really is for the most part. And it allows you to understand, okay, this will No, What role do women play in relationship to men? 
Well, first, they make themselves conscious. Let's not ever forget about that. And why, because why is he rejected? Once you get a little bit of coochie, you know what she's going to say? Do you like me? Well, mm, so do you want to watch a movie? For your safety, I strongly suggest you do the same. Get all your friends around, call every friend you have right now. Invite them over for a party. When they all turn up, pour out sparkling water. Say, everyone, let's have a glass of water together. Water can't hurt anybody. We're all probably dehydrated anyway. What's the worst water can do? Let's have a nice glass of water and everyone's gonna drink it. When you see that one dude, oh, there's bubbles. Never speak to him again. In 2022, around 48,800 women and girls worldwide were killed by their intimate partners or other family members, including fathers, mothers, uncles, and brothers. This means that, on average, more than 133 women or girls are killed every day by someone in their own family. Current and former intimate partners are by far the most likely perpetrators of femicide, accounting for an average of 55% of all intimate partner and family-related killings. Women are much more likely to be the victim of violence from someone they know than the stereotype of being attacked by some guy in the street. Yet that does happen. It's happened to me even. And if you know enough women, you know someone who that's happened to as well. So when people with big platforms like, say, Fresh and Fit, Abba and Preach, Just Pearly Things, Andrew Tate, or even the diet side of what we in internet communities call the Mansphere, like Jordan Peterson and other conservative pundits that agree with them, like Matt Walsh, proliferate the idea that women are some sort of alien to men, a devious puzzle that only those with a square jaw and a Bugatti can figure out, understand that women can be closed off and cautious to straight men for a good reason. But despite these risks, and the global rise in feminism, especially in recent years, from the US, to the Balkans, to India, women still seek relationships with men. Even the most ardent incel probably knows a few women, even if they don't get along with them too well since they started mouthing off about gynarchy and sexual market value. So why do we act like there's this unbreakable barrier between women and men? And especially, why are people so insistent on selling you this idea that women have a sinister motive in keeping men and women apart. I all the time that marriage isn't really a good institution in the United States anymore. A woman choosing a bartender who is broke over a rich guy is just so far removed from reality. The concept is known as monkey branch. 70% of all marriages end because the woman petitioned to have it in. it's yeah. set up so that the one with less money is the one who gets spousal support. Because they've been incentivized to do so because of the wealth transfer. This anti-woman rhetoric coming out of the manosphere obviously serves a purpose. Men are lonely and confused. We're all lonely and confused because capitalism has left us isolated from communities, overworked, with no time to socialize, never mind meet romantic partners. And even if we did have the time, we're exhausted. And some of us haven't had the time or space to develop the social skills to even know where to start doing that. When you take a chance finally and get, take the energy and the time to do this and it's not successful, it can be hard not to feel frustrated, even angry. It should have been me, not him. It's not fair! But whatever the causes, the effects are not just men blowing off a little steam. A study by Fulper et al, for example, found a significant correlation between the proliferation of misogynistic tweets and violent crimes against women in the United States. This stuff produces hate. And that hate has a real effect. Most people, sure, won't take their resentments against women to the next level. But some do. And the more prolific and more violent the rhetoric coming out of these platforms, the more likely that is. And that rhetoric has been increasing in recent years. A study by Farrell et al. in 2019 tracked violent language against women across Reddit and found a steady increase in both violent attitudes and misogyny in general across the platform over the decade from 2011 to 2018. And for those of you who have been on the internet from, well, the moment there was an internet like I have, this might surprise you. After all, was 4chan not super misogynistic? Didn't the pickup artist movement begin and end between that and now? Haven't these currents always existed? Well, yeah, but we don't have cult forums really anymore. We instead have huge websites that not only collate all sorts of different communities, but recommend these communities to those that might be susceptible. You might have struggled to find red pill content when it was restricted to just 4chan, but with Reddit, with YouTube, with TikTok, if it looks like you might just appreciate a post that channels perhaps a growing resentment towards women, it's served right to you. Just like that. For ad money, no less. And it's obvious why this is, right? Social media platforms need to keep you on their apps for longer and longer to earn revenue. Maximizing profit 
as is the aim of all of these companies, and any corporation under capitalism, is the be-all and end-all of these decisions, unless something pesky like the law prevents them from doing so. And even then, they pay the people who write those laws so that it never quite hurts their bottom line. And you know, nothing keeps you scrolling quite like anger. And you are angry, aren't you? If you're not, you will be, once we find the right post to hit you with. The sad truth is that none of these companies care what message they're pushing, even if it causes tangible real-world violence, whether that's the original incel killer Elliot Rogers, or a fucking genocide in Myanmar. If it makes money, they'll get all the blood in their hands that they can get. So how do we fight this? Am I really arguing that Avatar The Last Airbender was the one thing that could suppress the popularity of Andrew Tate or Sneeko and get people to realise we're in the people? Well, no, obviously not. But I don't think sexism, never mind this crypto-fascist manosphere, can be defeated with a Netflix show. But I do think it's emblematic of the environment we've entered as a society, where even the Feminism 101 rhetoric of 20 years ago is seen as beyond the pale by some where concessions are made to writing fascism as corporations accept the deadly backlash of people like lives of TikTok as a fact of life, and self-censor to avoid their outrage. Our media is not a passive player in our cultural environment. It is both symptomatic of the conditions that created it, and has the ability to shape it. And to see that, you need only look at how the rise of people like Andrew Tate, Fresh and Fit, Sneeko and others have affected the way some people talk, and how even more people think. Andrew Tate has a huge impact on what teenagers think. Like, everyone wants to be like him, like rich guy, Bugatti. And he's very positive about how to be successful, go to the gym, get a good mentality. These encounters are not uncommon. They come from a narrative curated by the Manosphere's corner of the internet. And while there are brilliant YouTubers like FD Signifier and Foreign Man in a Foreign Land countering that narrative on the same platforms that created it, to truly nip this in the bud, we need the fight back against this narrative to be bigger, more widespread, and harder to ignore than the narrative it created. Or we risk further violence, and a generation radicalised into violent action against half the population. As long as this hate is spread via narratives pushed over social media, we need to have a strong and persuasive counter-narrative. That doesn't just mean niche videos like this, or good and better videos on the Manosphere, like those by FD Signifier or T Noir, but having a variety of methods through which people can receive a narrative that doesn't leave them funneled into a dark place. Because when people are told there's only one way to be a man, they're gonna take that path. And the people telling young men that are the ones who are really going to do damage to both them and the people around them. A lot of people think I'm insane because I don't think women should vote. Everybody thinks I'm crazy for this opinion. If anything, this is probably my most extreme opinion. 90% of women have been on birth control. One out of three women has had an abortion. One out of three women has an STD. Uh, average body count is over five, so that your average wife has slept with over five people. 95% of women are not virgins on their wedding days. So I understand the complaint. Let me tell you a story. Not one from a fantasy realm, no benders, well, apart from this bender, no fire nation, no nothing. This is a real story, from modern Britain. A story about being trapped in a confined space with loud and angry strangers. And the things that teenage boys feel confident in saying in public, never mind in private. One evening in early 2022, I was on a train going from Manchester to Nottingham. I'd just got a job at the University of Manchester as a science technician, and I'd popped up north to look at some flats to move into. Just as an aside, rents in Manchester, and well, everywhere, are completely unaffordable, so I was feeling pretty annoyed already. Then, just as the train was going to set off, a group of 20 to 30 teenagers and one middle-aged man that these teenagers were affectionately named Savile got on the train. This train was rammed and would be hit by delay after delay, so we were about to become very, very familiar with Savile and his army of similarly inappropriate adolescents. About half an hour into the 60 or so people in this carriage being crammed together like sardines, the football chants in the teenagers turned from annoying to malicious. If you're from Britain, you'll know the ones. You know, get your tits out, get your tits out, get your tits out for the lads! Screams from one woman within their sights to get naked for them, to strip off, to show her tits, to have sex with them, threats of SA, all of that stuff, in both jeers and in song form. When it became clear they weren't going to stop, I reached my limit. Oi, I shouted, leave her the fuck alone. All of the teenage boys then turned to me. And then instead of stopping, they started doing it to me. Accusing my partner of being a man, begging me to get my tits out, to fuck me, calling my partner a Karen when they screamed at them to stop. It got worse in other ways too. The man they affectionately called Savile 
started shouting racist abuse at a South Asian man who was trying to defuse the situation with me. No one felt safe, and there wasn't just tension in the car anymore. It was the women and the black and brown people in the car being screamed at, being sexually and racially harassed, while the teenagers got bolder and bolder and the carriage stayed still. We didn't make it home for hours. The white men on the carriage took sides. Some with us, most excusing the actions of the teenagers. Boys will be boys and all that. One woman and her boyfriend behind me called the police and let me know they'd be arriving at the platform when we arrived in Nottingham. Eventually, when the police did come, once we arrived and they all got off the train, they asked if I wanted to press charges. I just asked them if it was possible to tell their mothers what they'd done. Their sisters and their mothers. The policeman didn't respond. I think he thought I was joking. I wasn't. I didn't want these kids in jail. I wanted them to look their mothers in the eye and tell them what they said, the things they'd done, the disgusting ways they viewed women, the threats. And I wanted them to face the fact that we were people, that women everywhere are people, not receptacles for the desires of these goblins. One of the last things I remember saying to the kids was when I and the guy who'd been getting racial abuse from the gang's resident nonce asked one of them how he'd feel if someone said these things to his mum. He laughed and said, I wouldn't care. Yes, you fucking would, I said, pulling my hair out. I'd let them, he said. I'd join in. The man next to me gave a very convincing and impassioned speech about how that was an insult to his mother and about the need to treat women with care and respect. The boy didn't seem to listen. Multiple times in that hours long journey where people couldn't move, couldn't use the toilet, couldn't know when they'd arrive at the destination, the crowd almost broke into fights. All we could do is hear the worst thoughts of these boys and react. This is one of the only stories of this ilk that I can actually tell on YouTube. Others would immediately get this video demonetized or even taken down. Any woman who's walked home alone at night, being locked in a taxi by the driver, being cornered by someone you thought was a friend, has horror stories about how the way some men are taught to view women has come knocking at their door and manifests in violence. All over the world, the manosphere has tainted the conversations of teenage boys. Adults, for the most part, aren't watching this stuff. You can read report after report of horrified teachers watching their male students repeating Andrew Tate's talking points, talking about teachers and students alike like they're less than human for being women. This is a problem across social media and the wider media sphere that props these people up and allows their vile hatred to spread. From Piers Morgan interviewing Andrew Tate and just pearly things with little to no pushback, giving them a mainstream platform with which to push their hyper-conservative views agenda, to YouTube allowing misogynistic outlets like Fresh and Fit to go off for hours about how women are brainless sluts that only care about money and finding someone with the right skull measurements, to the mess that is misogynistic TikTok. People have been radicalized by this stuff. Incel killers were once an unheard of thing. Not anymore. Not for a long time. We need people subverting this narrative to be louder than ever. We need stories subverting this narrative now more than ever. But more importantly, we need companies to stop feeding into this new far-right pipeline. Change your algorithms, ban channels that spread hate, or at least deprioritize them, and make it impossible for people to make a living convincing an entire generation of boys that women are demons only worthy of your violence or your lust. Not your respect, and certainly not your reverence. Manosphere ideologies are born from their position as a subculture. They thrive on being the hidden advice that mainstream media and mainstream society won't teach you. And this goes back to the very beginning, from the game to Rouge V to the modern late capitalist scammers that prey on lonely men, your Gary V, your Andrew Tate, that tell you you'll never be able to solve your problems, that you'll never be able to get women, that you'll never become confident without paying the big bucks to attend their in-depth course. But while the manosphere's position in relation to the mainstream is part of what sells it as an answer to men's problems, the more this contrasts with mainstream narratives, the more people will question its more extreme edges, and the more people will be turned off. If wider culture makes concessions to avoid ruffling feathers of people that might be susceptible to this stuff, we risk making this step into potential extremism into a pipeline. A smooth transition from being ambivalent on discussions of sexism, to edgelords, to incels, to Elliot Rogers. Now don't get me wrong, it's a very leaky pipe. Most people don't get all the way to the end. But some people do. And for every logical leap that gets smoothed over by a culture too blinded by the profit motive to tackle these narratives out in the open, Another person won't notice that they've gone from being resentful of constant rejection to hatred of women, and from there, they can be groomed more and more easily by those further to the right into outright violence. And while this part of the internet is firmly a subculture, the mainstream is much more welcoming to them than it is to trans people, intersectional feminism, to discussions of systemic racism or to class politics. 
while Piers Morgan has interviewed people like Hassan in the past, when he talks to left-wing individuals, it's generally with a much more confrontational style than with people like Andrew Tate. Just take his conversation with Ash Sarkar compared to his conversation with Just Pearly Things. Proposals like taking the vote away from him <laughs> are deeply regressive. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to remove, just from yourself, the right to vote. If you protest. feel so strongly and about that, where, where, where was your protest march against Obama? If you found that well. unconscionable too, you do where not was the have march? to go out and march against standards. everything in order to make a point about one thing. No, if you find them both unconscionable, no, it's the same issue, wrong. you have to... People promoting a return with the V pseudo-fascist lifestyle for women are treated as strange but fun to talk to by mainstream journalists, much more often than someone advocating for socialism or suggesting trans people be treated fairly, at least in the UK where I'm from. And in this way, they receive the blessing and the backing of the mainstream, even as they are kept at arm's length, as something adjacent to the dominant conversation, while not quite replacing it. But as this happens, the mainstream can react to this reactionary current, backing off more radical ideas from the left, giving leeway to more conservative worldviews, especially in the name of maximizing audiences, and therefore maximizing profit, which is, after all, the goal of every corporation in a capitalist system. Hello, I like money. Even the feminist narratives that take off in our current media climate are either feminist 101 material like the Barbie movie, or indeed the original Avatar The Last Airbender, where the message never quite gets past the basics of equality between the sexes, and cannot, for fear of hurting profits, touch on more radical ideas, which makes the decline or censorship of such narratives more worrying. From Avatar removing this plotline, to the Batgirl movie being scrapped, if even the basic, unarguable stuff is going, is there any hope of us actually getting messages out there that can genuinely make a difference? Perhaps, ironically considering its radical roots, the other current of feminist thought the mainstream is happy to platform includes turf-adjacent feminists such as Caitlin Moran pushing pseudoscientific evolutionary psychology about how men are jealous of women's ability to give birth. In one of the previous books I, I put that I think all the plots of superhero movies are actually male appropriation of the female story because those are all stories about teenage boys who suddenly their bodies go haywire and they're shooting webs or they can like, you know, they've got this extra strength or they're there to save the world but they never get the credit like Batman. Mm -hmm. That's mums. Like suddenly we're shooting these weird substances out of our body milk and we've got these superpowers and strengths we give birth but we never get any credit for saving the world or terse themselves. Jermaine Greer, the go-to feminist on British TV when I was growing up and beyond, for example, and who has said things that if people were to believe she was the be-all and end-all of feminism, you would end up with a lot of people in the manosphere. Because she's all but admitted to some extremely predatory behaviour, as well as denigrating the Me Too movement and defending sex pests like Harvey Weinstein. This is as radical as a feminist British TV can handle without getting scared. And that's not even mentioning the horrifically bigoted way she speaks about trans people. Meanwhile, actual intersectional feminists are kept on the sidelines. At best, they might be interviewed once when a book comes out and get shouted out on morning TV for daring to suggest that Piers Morgan isn't a sweet, innocent baby. Instead, the face of mainstream feminism, at least on national TV, is much more likely to be white, transphobic, and rich centrists who want to sell themselves as feminists while truly only caring about breaking down barriers insofar as it can help create a new generation of girl bosses. For any men who are watching this who aren't aware, Feminism isn't about creating a generation of Rule 63 Jeffreys Bezos, but about liberation from oppression. For freedom from draconian gender roles, not just for women, but for men too. Because patriarchy hurts men. A lot. It stops them from being able to speak about their feelings, denigrates them for crying, insists they be strong at all times, even when they're at their most vulnerable, and incentivizes them to keep all friendships at arm's length, preventing them from forming close bonds, and closing off the possibility of intimacy something every human being deeply needs, regardless of your gender. And this is why it's so important to be presenting alternate narratives to the temptations of the manosphere. Men are lonely. They're lost. They want answers. And people like Gary Vee or Andrew Tate can tell them, if you want answers, pay for my course. Or maybe they buy a Jordan Peterson book and it takes them one step back from the ledge and they start listening to the other stuff he's saying the transphobia, the enforced monogamy, and then you end up with someone who is impossible to be around if you're a woman. I've been hit on in public by Jordan Peterson fans and it's horrific. And you know they're Jordan Peterson fans because they always tell you. They start the conversation by trying to explain to you why feminism is wrong, make themselves out to be super smart, and then, if you're me, try to explain how much more they know than you about a subject you literally have a PhD in. Hey there, is there a project you're working on? I know more than you. All right. And he's nowhere near the worst of them, I should be clear, as much as I like to poke fun at him. There are Jordan Peterson books in every post office in the country I live in for sale. For some reason, my partner's dad has one on the shelf. But if you scrape the surface of the chauvinistic world by getting into the work of one guy, even someone who hides fascist talking points in his work like Jordan Peterson, you're not necessarily going to fall into the pipeline wherein lies Fresh and Fierce or Andrew Tate. People who insist that women have a secret agenda, that women are liars inherently, 
and that only they know the secret of how to manipulate them into giving you what you want, the reward you deserve, that they're hiding from you. Anyone who has been on the receiving end of verbal abuse by boys and men recently, or even people who just spend enough time out and about to see it happening to other people, can tell that there is a huge problem with how certain social media algorithms funnel violent material for kids. And not just anti-feminist stuff either, though that's probably the most prominent avenue you'll see. But I see kids on the bus from town with Nazi symbolism on their notebooks, with totem cops and Celtic crosses, in the same way I used to have Doctor Who stickers on my planners. The internet is amazing, but we haven't sussed out every way it can be misused yet. And just as I've met people from Britain to the Balkans to East Africa who you know the same leftist YouTubers I listen to, people who are susceptible to hateful rhetoric the world over receive the same push of manosphere and other far-right voices. One of the biggest pro-Andrew Tate rallies in the world was in Greece. And in Kenya, conservative voices are sharing around Matt Walsh's What is a Woman? Culture is global now, and thus we all receive the same problems, though filtered through our disparate cultures. We need to stop this. We need to educate kids to promote narratives that counter these misogynistic currents being pushed for hate and for profit. We need to build a world where misogyny is unacceptable, where solidarity and love for all people is the norm. Violence against women is rising all over the world. We need to answer that rise with a response. A movement to free men from patriarchy, from the need to peacock and pretend to be this parody of masculinity that people like Andrew Tate espouse. Men need to feel free to be vulnerable, to ask for help from women and from each other both. We need more stories that don't stay away from these topics for fear of controversy, but instead confront it head on. Misogyny is a character flaw to be overcome. And if we refuse to confront that, we leave room for the opposite narrative. And yes, this is not new. There have been versions of what we now call the Manosphere for years, but its current manifestation is global, is spread via social media algorithms in ways that allow for different sorts of narratives, more mask off, less of a curiosity and more of a, this is what women don't want you to know, sell. I wasn't immune to this stuff either during my own adolescence. For a while there, I was very resentful of women. I thought they had it so fucking good that every boy secretly wished they could be a woman, because being a woman was just objectively better. So why do they keep saying being a woman is so hard? It's what everyone clearly wants. If you've been thinking like this, congratulations, you're transgender. <laughs> and your feelings have been warped by society into something that you need to untangle. From resentment to not being who you truly are, to resentment at those who don't have to try, or so you think. Because oh god, do people put more effort into performing femininity than you could ever know. Cis women don't wake up with shaved legs, makeup on, perfectly straightened hair. This again is the impression you get from the media environment you grow up in. And it's lying to you. That aside, I grew up with teenage boys. Even thought I was one for a while there. And it can be really confusing when you think you're doing everything right and still feel lonely. You might be wondering why everyone else can get a girlfriend and you can't. I can tell you now, because I've been there, that there are probably already tons of people that like you. You just don't know it, or you can't read the signs. I learned years after the fact how many people had crushes on me as a teenager. But at the time, I was convinced I was a loser with a capital L. And the people that convinced me of that? Other teenage boys. Their bullying. Their relentless punching down convinced me I was worth nothing. And instead of blaming them, I blamed myself. And unknowingly, blinded myself to the fact that women don't see men the way that men see men. Hell, Jack Black could get it from, well, a lot more people than you think, and he's an overweight goofball who dresses like, well, what he is, an aging rocker. And I bet you, more of the straight women you know have crushes on this lovable goofball than your chiselled pickup artist, self-help guru types like Andrew Tate. But those aren't the stories our culture tells us. The stories we grow up with are largely written by men, so they reflect how men see the world. So we grow up with the handsome man in the TV show getting crushes left, right and centre, while the lovable goofball stays off to the side. And more pernicious still, we grow up with the time-tested narrative that the main character gets rewarded for good deeds with a relationship with the woman he's been chasing after the whole time. This is a dangerous narrative that persists to this day, and it needs to be counted. You don't earn a woman's affection by performing a series of steps. People like you or they don't. And you're only going to find out if they do by becoming friends, hanging out, meeting more people, joking around, and eventually you will find someone who likes you. I speak from personal experience here. I had a lot of bad influences in my teens. I had a lot of things I regret. I hate the person that I was then, deeply. And the best thing I ever did during those years was stop listening to those voices around me telling me how to act. 
the sexist, bigoted voices lying to me about what women are like, what women want, and how to treat them. And just going back to being a punk-obsessed nerd deep in the closet. And if you can do that, you too can have long, loving relationships with people you truly care about. Even if you do end up coming out as a woman later on. That part might just be me. We need more stories like Sockers. And less stories like... Sockers. The Princess and the Tower archetype is a dangerous narrative when it's so pervasive. And it creates unrealistic expectations. Especially for those of us who do have trouble socialising. Those of us who are neurodivergent, who learn life lessons through TV and books rather than out in public. I had a horrible time feeling comfortable talking to people for years, and was constantly looking for a secret to make it easier, a guide to talking to people, to getting people to like me. But that just doesn't exist. In the end, I learned to turn my brain off to that through compliments I received when I'd stopped overthinking about how fun a time people had hanging out. That helped. And I promise you, people love hanging out with you too, whoever you are. People, as a rule, like being around other people. But I know I absolutely needed to unlearn these lessons I learned from fiction. I am not the main character in a story. When I do something important, I am not owed a romantic reward. Life doesn't work like it does in stories. People don't necessarily tell each other how they're feeling. Sometimes people you like don't like you back. Sometimes it's much more fun to just be friends with someone. Most of the time, even. In fact, straight men, I promise you, if you really want a surefire way to both feel more confident and up your chances of finding someone, make friends with more women. And I mean friends. Do not go in with any romantic intentions. In fact, turn off that part of your brain completely and make friends with women. You will meet more people. You will have great conversations. You will make lifelong friends. And just by hanging out with them, you will unlearn a lot of the ugly stuff both the media and teenage boys have taught you about how both women and the world work. Men don't just turn up places being strong and cool and women fall all over them like some sort of lovesick princess in the tower. Women fall in love with men who show them respect, who learn about their lives, who come to appreciate them for their strengths as well as their vulnerabilities. And to be honest, having met a lot of straight women, women like men who put on makeup too, but you can leave that one alone. I'm not about to feed into the whole drag queens converting people thing. One TV show cannot, of course, save the world. But I think it's worrying that companies like Netflix feel like they can't show a man overcoming misogyny or a man dressing in drag in a way that's not demeaning but empowering even. And I think this, unfortunately, says something about our global culture. Narratives that were once proud to tap progressive principles are made safe. Their calls dulled, their edges sanded down. A safe corporate product that doesn't upset anyone. A product that sexists can watch without feeling threatened. A product without theme or heart, to avoid making the rising tide of fascists mad. This is helping them out. Do not lie down for the evils of the world because you fear losing money. All you do then is encourage them to run you down. The world needs feminist narratives more than ever. We can't get complacent. Sexism hasn't been solved. Just because more people than ever consider themselves feminists doesn't mean that we've won. We've only just got a taste of the backlash. And the backlash is violent, widespread, and needs an answer. We have an answer. Don't be afraid to give it. And thanks for watching. When you have sex with a girl, the game is over. You get to figure out who the fuck she really is for the most part. And it allows you to understand, okay, this will work. Now you're a man! Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. If you like this video, why not like it? If you dislike this video, why not like it anyway? Because you feel sorry for me. Leave a comment saying that you like me and my face. Subscribe and tell your friends about it. I am, well, as, as, as always, poor. So if you have a few coins burning a hole in your pocket and you hate to see a tram like me down on her luck, why not get, help me get out of my massive, over, horrifying overdraft and send me some money. You can give one-time donations on Coffee or PayPal, links below as always, or better yet, sign up to my Patreon, where you get early videos, access to the members only Discord, my Nintendo Switch friend code, and exclusive content, such as long-form interviews with Princess Weeks, Rosenkreutz, and Jesse Gender. In addition to all that good stuff, you'll also, if you sign up, get your name right out at the end of each video, just like these lovely people. Sarah Rudston, 
Jason Haig, Frank McManus, Susan Foster, Helena, Sierra Whiskey, Orestria, Ali Catkill, Brian, John N. Scully, Jan Lloyd Luciente, Jason Cribbett, Shield Vader, Robin Podolsky, Exploding Turtle, Casual Observer, Terry Roberts, Manta Ray, Courtney Burmack, Sleepy Slug, Philippa Tabroga, Sam Piglet, Brain Douche, Artie Wolf, Hayley Gaylor, Greg Noble, Diana McMillan, Carolyn Regalado, Alexandra Lilly, PJ Lisbrill, Howard Lott, Lara Van Loon, Neronia Scotton, and Joey Cobalt. Thank you all so much for listening. This one was, uh, well, I didn't quite have a script, but it was also quite heavy. Uh, <laughs> So send some love if you have some, and uh, if they're idiots arguing in the comments, that's just to be expected. Just don't, don't give them, don't give them too much time a day. All right. See you next time. Okay. This will.